Welcome back, everybody, to Spring One. Well, I am going to be your MC for the next four hours. But more importantly, let's hear Violetta Georgievia give us a talk on how to avoid common mistakes when using Reactor Netty. Violetta, take it away. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Do you enjoy your second date, Spring One? My name is Violetta Georgieva, and uh, today I'll tell you stories uh, how you can avoid common mistakes when using Reactor Neti. But first, let's say a few words about me. I work at VMware. I'm the main Reactor Neti committer. I'm a long time Tomcat committer and also the release manager for Tomcat 7. I also contribute to Spring Framework and other open source projects. But the talk today is not for me. The talk today is for how you can solve memory leaks, how you can handle connection close problems. So the agenda for today, I will start with a few words about Reactor Neti. Then I will continue with logging. Why logging? Because knowing how to read logs, actually, this is the half of the work that you need in order to find and solve your problem. Then I'll continue with one use case uh, that has a memory leak and show you how you can solve that. Later, we will have timeouts, what we can provide with Reactor Neti and Spring Framework. And why timeouts? Because they are closely related to the connection closed problems. And, I, uh, and then I uh, finish my presentations presentation with connection pool and how sometimes things that seems innocent can also cause connection close, uh, also cause connection close. So, Reactor Neti. Reactor Neti is part of the Reactor project. Uh, it provides the necessary reactive streams bridge for Neti so that you can use reactive streams API over Neti and in particular Flux and Mono because Reactor Neti is built on top of Reactor Core. As a networking API, uh, Reactor Neti does not add uh, additional features on top of Neti, but it simplifies a lot the server and the client creation. It provides the necessary pipeline for Neti and also transforms everything for, to, to Flux and Mono. And the most important, it supports back pressure. Uh, depending, um, it, it provides several builders for servers and clients. And depending on the protocol that you want to use, you may create UDP, TCP, or HTTP server and client. What is the relation between Reactor Neti and Spring? The reactive programming in Spring Framework 5 is built on top of the project reactor. In Spring Boot 2, you can create reactive applications with Spring Web Flux. And there, the default server runtime is actually Reactor Neti. Spring Web Client. The default HTTP client that it uses is Reactor Neti. Spring Cloud Gateway, the server and the client that are used there are Reactor Neti. And last but not least, we uh, prepared for you a lot of new features with the release that is coming in, in October just for the Spring Framework 5 free release. So let's start with logging. But first, a small disclaimer here. All the code samples that I will use for the, in order to show the use cases are really, really simple ones. Why? Because I do not want to stress on whether the uh, solution is simple or complex, but on what happens and how we can solve it. So let's start. My first uh, endpoint you can expect it is hello world. So uh, my endpoint will respond to a get requests, 
with Hello World. But what is interesting, we will delay slightly this string. Why? Because typically in the real world applications, you do not send just one string. You receive a request, you do some processing, then you reply with something. So, as a typical developer, the first thing that I will do is actually to request my application, right? So here I am. I requested my application, opened the logs. Uh, in the old books, I know that I should use the thread ID if I want to trace my request. And I did that. What happened? This is the these are the log entries related to this particular thread. A new connection was established. I received a request. Great. It says delay the Hello World request with 100 milliseconds. And actually, that happens. The response was returned after the delay, and we are responding with 200 OK. Now, I'm happy, I called all my friends. We put a lot of load on my application. Then I opened the log files in order to trace one particular thread, for example, and to see what's going on there, whether I am able, again, to, to see from my request from the beginning, establishing a connection, to the end where I am returning the response. So what I, what I have here again, this is my thread. The connection was established, that is, that's expected. The request was received. And then another connection was established. And then a third connection was established. In this locked snippet, at the end, we have a new request. But actually, we cannot say to which of the previous two connections this request belongs. What happened? If we look again at um, the endpoint, we have a delay here, and this delay is really, really important. Why? Because we are in a non-blocking world. In a non-blocking world with event loops, we have just few threads and we are able to handle a lot of connections with these few threads. Here, we do not have any more thread per request. Typically, we have one IO selector that just dispatches the incoming requests. And we have worker threads that receives the request, process the data, writes the response, and everything is a non-blocking. So if we return again to the endpoint, here we do not block the thread. We do not wait for this delay in order to send the response, but the thread is used in order to uh, process other incoming requests. So, now I know that I cannot use the thread idea anymore in order, in order to correlate um, the logs and to, to see what happens with my request. What I can use instead of the thread ID? I can use the connection ID. Let's, let's take this connection ID and select only the log entries related to this connection ID. Here is what we have now. Uh, the new connection was established. The request was received. Here, we even have some entry that we wasn't able to see previously. And this actually that our Hello World is written using another thread, not the one provided from uh, by, by Reactor Native, but some other thread. 
Then, after the delay, we are able to send the response with 200 OK. Now, using the connection ID, I'm able again to trace my request from the beginning to the end. So, what we have in details here? Because Reactor Neti is on a lower level than Spring Framework, in Spring way, uh, Framework, we have only the connection ID. While in Reactor Neti, in addition to the connection ID, we have the local address and the remote address. Why this is important? Later in the presentation, you will see how we will use this information. Can we say what is the state of the connection just looking at the logs? Yes, the dash between the local and the remote address actually says the connection is opened. The exclamation mark says the connection is closed. And that's HTTP 1.1. Somebody will say, okay, with HTTP 2, we have just one connection with many streams. How we can use now the connection information. Here, in addition to the connection ID, the local and the remote address, you also have the stream ID. And now having this information, you are again available to track your request from the beginning to the end. Now, that's great. Uh, I can track uh, what happens on reactor net level, I can track what happens on the Spring Framework level, but I want to use this connection ID in order to track what happens with my application. And actually that's possible. Having the server web exchange, you can obtain this special walk ID. And here in this very simple example, I just prepend that information to my walk entries. And now, if I request again my endpoint, here I can see preparing the response with the correct connection ID and response sent again with the correct connection ID. So if I need to summarize that, you have the log, the log ID uh, on the server, just use the server web exchange, you have the log ID on the client, use the client request, and then you will have uh, everything from reactor netty level to, to the application level, and you will be able to track it. Well, that's, that's very good, but uh, what happens if I need to track what exactly was sent to the wire and what exactly was received from the wire? In reactor netty, we have wire logging. And it is really fairly easy to um, configure that uh, wire logging in Spring Framework. On the server side, you can use just your uh, friend server customizer and customize the configuration for the server. Here, we just enable the wire tab. On the client side, when you are building the web client, you can provide a client connector with a custom custom customized uh, HTTP client, where again we enable the wiretap. How it looks like, uh, let's say that uh, we are on the server and we receive um, some request. This is what you will see in the server logs as uh, incoming data. And when the server writes the response, this is what you will see as a data sent to the wire, and even you can see uh, the flashes, etc. Uh, what happens if we use HTTP2? When the wire logging is enabled and you use HTTP2, you can see in addition the settings negotiation, then you can see what was received as an incoming request for this particular stream. You can see creation of the stream and then your server uh, responds with some uh, data uh, to this request. Um, what I can uh, say in addition 
to the wire logging is that currently the wire logging in the released versions uh, has only this uh, format, which we call hex format. While with the upcoming uh, RC1 uh, release, this um, mid of this September, uh, we will provide you uh, three, three different uh, formats. A simple one uh, with which you can track only the bytes, the number of the bytes that were read or written, a hex, the current one, and the texture, which we call human readable. So stay tuned. But let's stop with, with the logging. Although it is important, uh, let's move on and um, look at the more interesting use cases. And one of these cases is memory leaks. Why you may experience memory leaks? Because in Reactor Neti, we use pulled byte buffers. Uh, pulled byte buffers is a topic for another session, maybe. But uh, what is important here to, to know is that by default, Reactor Neti uses direct memory. And um, in order to achieve um, allocation and deallocation performance, we use pulled byte buffers. But this comes with a big responsibility. Uh, there are rules how these byte buffers are released and who or what is responsible to release these byte buffers. Um, the main rule is the, uh, the last component that access this byte buff is responsible to release it. So let's say that we have an outgoing data. For example, if you are on the server, this will be the response. And if you are on the client, this will be the request. Um, Reactor Neti and Neti are the last components that will access these byte buffs before sending the data to the network. So they are responsible in this case to release the byte buffs. But what happens when we have an incoming data? For example, on the server, we receive a request and on the client, we receive a response. Then, the framework codecs are responsible to, trans to read the data from these byte buffs, to, to transport that data, and then to release the memory. Or it might not be the framework, but the application. It depends. So remember these uh, important things. Now let's proceed with the use case. Here I have uh, one really very simple uh, endpoint, which just accepts GET uh, requests, and using web client, uh, sends a request to a remote uh, service. And once we receive a response from the remote service, we are interested only in the status code. And we will send actually the status code information as a final response to the end client, let's say it like that. Here uh, we have, we use the exchange uh, method on the web client. And let's see, uh, I used uh, uh, a tool to create a load uh, for, for that particular endpoint. And when I opened the log files, I actually saw that we have a memory leak. I still don't know what causes this memory leak. Uh, I have only this exception. Uh, I can see that the byte buff was allocated in some code in Neti, but that's all. I do not have any more information that I can use in order to proceed with the investigation. What I can do in this case? In this case, um, I know that this uh, this this 
problems are hardly reproducible, for example, but if you are able to reproduce that, then do you need to do two additional things. First, increase the leak detection level to advanced or paranoid so that we are able to receive more information about this memory leak. And second, increase the logging level for reactor native to debug. Or if you are not able to increase the logging level for the whole reactor netty, then just increase the logging level for this particular uh, logger because uh, uh, it is important. So I did that. I again um, made a lot of load uh, for my endpoint. And then that's what I received in the log files. This is just one small part of the stack, but typically this stack will contain information for the components that access this byte buff, or in my case, it was byte buff holder. So the number one is the component that was la that la uh, the last component that accessed this byte buff or byte buff holder. Here it was reactor netty. Uh, we add always the connection ID to this stack so that we are able later on using that stack, uh, that connection ID to, to track the request and uh, to track what's, what hap what's happened with that request. But here what actually we can see is that the incoming data is there. It is buffered in reactor netty, but nobody actually consumed that data. I, using the connection ID, you can see here the, the connection was acquired from the pool, dial handler was applied, uh, here I skip all the send requests, etc. But the most important is that I received the response. The response is chunked and that's all. First, I do not know whether this was consumed. I do not know whether we received everything or we are still um, we are still missing some data that will come later. And what happens? Let's return again to the um, endpoint. And here, actually, here it is what happened. Here is what what's wrong actually with that code. With that, I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Sorry. With that code, uh, I see two problems. Let's start with the first one. Reactor Netty and the HTTP client that we provide um, use, uses connection pool. Why we use a connection pool? Because uh, from the from performance point of view, it's better to establish a connection once and then to reuse that connection for several requests. Imagine that uh, if you do not have uh, a connection pool, then for every request, you need to establish a connection to the remote endpoint. So having a connection pool means that we can reuse the connections. That's great but we need also to know what's the state of the connections in order to return that connections to the pool. Here, if you remember in the walks, we received the response. The response is chunked. We have some data, but we don't know whether we will receive more data or that was all. So such connections, reactor netty cannot return to the pool their state is unknown. This is the first, uh, the first problem. The second problem is we are using exchange method of the web client. What we have for the exchange method in the Spring Framework documentation. If you use the exchange method, you are responsible to consume the incoming content regardless whether it is a positive scenario or whether you have some errors or you have some cancellations. And for the cancellations, we will speak later in the presentation. So in order to 
um, Spring Framework provides us another more convenient method uh, that guides us how to consume the, the incoming data, and it is Retrieve. And these days, Retrieve uh, uh, pulls uh, uh, other, um, uh, in, in combination with other methods, is almost it can solve your use case in, let's say, 90% of the use cases. Let's see here. Uh, for example, if we want to consume um, the incoming data, but in addition to that, we need also the information for the metadata, which means uh, headers or status code, etc. Retrieve with a combination of to entity actually provides all this information. And in addition, what happens behind the scenes? To entity actually takes the byte buffs, transforms here in this example, this information to string and releases the memory. So once we receive the entity and the body and the metadata, the byte buffs are now uh, released, so we do not have memory leaks in this case. What happens uh, if we need to respond to a particular status code with a custom error handling? Again, uh, we have a solution for that. Retrieve plus on status gives you this uh, possibility. You can uh, return a custom exception based on the status code. What you should know is that, uh, again, uh, if you expect to have a content, you should consume it. But if you do not consume it, Spring Framework will automatically re release the byte buffs and free uh, the memory again. So we are again okay in that, um, in that use case. What happens if uh, you really don't want uh, the, the response body? You need, uh, for example, only the metadata. Again, retrieve with release body. Uh, this will release, uh, will drain the incoming uh, response body or retrieve plus to bodiless entity. This will drain again the uh, incoming uh, response body, but in addition, we will provide you uh, headers and the status code. So I, I really recommend these two, two methods uh, if, you, if you do not need the response body. Why? Because here Spring Framework drains the response body, which means once the response body is received, uh, everything was received from the server and drained, uh, we can return, Reactor Neti can return that connection to the connection pool and reuse it for the next request. While with the third method, which is body to mono, void, this method says, I do not want this response body. I do not want you to drain that response body. But in that case, Reactor Neti cannot return such connection to the pool because we do not know whether we need to receive something more from the server. So in that case, when you use body to mono, we will close that connection and we will remove it from the connection pool. And I think, uh, uh, let me say, um, let me let me summarize here the, the memory leaks topic. Um, yes, on the server, you still have incoming data, but um, uh, having memory leaks on the server is a rare use case. Why? Because, um, uh, Yes, uh, Reactor Net will buffer the incoming data, and uh, yes, uh, the application may decide not to consume that data, but once the application decides to return the response, Reactor Net will uh, release that data and will free the buffers. Why? Because we think that once you return the response, 
you do not need the incoming um, the data from from the request anymore which is not the case with the client because with the client you receive the response and actually it is only the application that knows how to proceed with that response and it's really really crucial that the application says to web client what to do with the incoming data so with that let me proceed with uh, the timeouts and what kind of timeouts we have uh, in react or Netty and spring framework uh, what we have on the server on the server uh, we have um, ability to add a read timeout handler uh, this read timeout handler applies uh, a timeout for the read operation. And uh, that's that's very good. Uh, for example, if you like uh, if you want something like a keep a live timeout, which means uh, the time between two requests, you can use that uh, read timeout handler. Or if you want to control the incoming data, so to control the, the read between different chunks of the incoming data, again, you can use this read timeout handler. What is the trick here? Uh, as I said, this is the timeout for the read operations. And this may interfere with the TOS handshake where we also have read operations. Uh, this may interfere also with um, uh, with the response when when we are processing the response because uh, let's imagine we have some processing latency on the server. Uh, we may delay the response, which on the other um, which which also will delay the next read operation. So you may receive a read timeout because of the delayed response. What we have on the client side. <laughs> On the client side, I already mentioned that uh, we use by default uh, connection pool. And we have uh, max idle time, which means the max time that this connection will stay, stay idle in the pool. Uh, we, we have max lifetime, which means the max time uh, that the connection will stay alive. In, in, all, uh, in these two situations, once this timeout is reached, the connection will be closed and removed from the from the pool. Uh, what we have on the client level? On the client level, we have um, a connect timeout, which means the max time uh, waiting for establishing a connection. And we have also a default response timeout, which means this timeout will be applied to all requests that are um, for all requests using uh, this um, uh, for this HTTP client. Uh, how you can uh, customize that response time? You can use an API provided by web client and you can apply another response timeout uh, for, for a particular request, for example. Uh, here, uh, you may ask, uh, Okay, but why why not using timeout on the flux and mono as, uh, for example, a response timeout for the client, let's say. And the answer is yes. Uh, we can use the timeout for um, uh, for mono and flux as a response timeout because this timeout is actually the time between two signals, right? Uh, we can use also this timeout for uh, uh, be between the two different chunks of, of the incoming data. Uh, but again, because this is the time between two signals, this means that this, this timeout may interfere with establishing of the connection because this is the time between two signals, right? or this may interfere the TOS handshake. And uh, uh, at, uh, at the end also, it may, um, it may interfere with uh, um, 
how we send the request, how how fast we send the request. Because if we have a processing latency on the client, we may send the request uh, with some delay. And when we, we receive a timeout, it may actually be because uh, uh, the request was uh, slow and not uh, the response that was slow, right? So the, the answer here is, yes, we can use the timeout for the mono and flux, but have in mind all these, uh, all these uh, things. And now how these uh, timeouts um, apply to uh, the connection closed uh, use cases. Uh, let me start first uh, with the connection uh, with the use case where we have uh, network latency. Uh, when we have network latency, we might want to apply some read timeout uh, configuration on the server. So here is my target server. Uh, I have 50 milliseconds uh, read timeout. As an uh, endpoint, I have one very, very simple endpoint that just tackles the incoming body. And the endpoint that I will actually request is this one. It is a very simple uh, endpoint. It um, receives uh, GET requests. It uses a uh, web client in order to send a POST request to my target server. And what I have here is that I will send my content with some delay and here uh, it will be 100 milliseconds. Why? Because I want to simulate uh, network latency. So I requested that, uh, opened the logs and what I uh, observed there is actually connection observed an error. And what error? our friend premature closed exception. So if you remember, I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation that uh, at some point we will need to know um, uh, the connection information. And uh, this is the time when we need to know the, the, the connection information. Here is the local address. And with uh, this local address, we, we have the client port. With this client port, actually we can go to the target server and try to find what happened there so that we receive this premature close exception. So I went to the uh, logs for the target server. Uh, that's my client port. I uh, extracted all the records uh, related to this connection. And what I observe is that actually uh, the connection did not observe uh, incoming data for 50 milliseconds. In that case, as our configuration was 50 milliseconds, a read timeout exception will be uh, thrown and the connection will be closed. And actually, that's, that's the, the cause for the premature cause exception received on the client side. So let's now see what happens if instead of network latency, we have processing latency on the server. And again, we have a configuration for the, for the read, write, read timeout, uh, 50 milliseconds. This time, our endpoint is not just echoing the body, the incoming body, but uh, also delaying this body with uh, some time. Why? Because we want to simulate processing latency. And here is our endpoint. Uh, this time, it's, it's really, really simple. It, uh, it sends, uh, sends a post request to our target server with some content. And again, when we request that endpoint, we receive premature close exception. What happened this time? It happened that because we delay the response, we delay also the next um, read operation. And again, our configuration is 50 milliseconds for the read timeout. The server uh, 
we do we do not uh, we do not observe uh, any read uh, operation for 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 this time, and the read timeout exception is strong and the connection is uh, closed again. What kind of other timeouts we may have that can cause premature close exception? Uh, keep a live timeout is um, such uh, such use case. As I said, um, when we are uh, using Reactor Neti, uh, we can use Reactor uh, Read uh, Timeout Handler as a Keep Alive Timeout, but by default we do not have any any timeout. Uh, what happens if my target server uses Tomcat? And this is interesting. Uh, by default, in the server XML, uh, we have a connection timeout specified to be 20 seconds, right? And you will say, okay, the connection timeout is 20 seconds, but uh, that's not the keep alive timeout. Actually, the keep alive timeout implicitly is set to be the connection timeout. So this means that if Tomcat does not observe uh, a request for this connection in 20 seconds, it will close this connection. Uh, what other components we may have uh, in our infrastructure, uh, also having keep a lifetime out, we may have proxies, we may have load balancers, all of them has something like keep a live timeout or max idle timeout. So, uh, for the first two use cases with network latency and processing latency, we were not able to do anything than either retry the request or uh, just say, okay, the request failed and that's all. Uh, here with uh, keep a wife timeout, actually we have a solution and the solution is um, a proper configuration on the connection pool on the client. Um, we may um, configure the max idle time to be less than the max idle time or the keep a life timeout on the target server. Uh, when we do that, we, uh, when Reactor Neti acquires um, or tries to acquire a connection from the pool, it checks uh, this max idle timeout. If it, uh, if it was reached, uh, then uh, Reactor Net will close that connection and will try to acquire another one or even to create, to create or establish another one if we do not have connections in the connection pool. Uh, what else we can configure on the connection pool? Uh, by default, the leasing strategy of the connection pool is FIFO, which means when Reactor Native tries to acquire, uh, it will choose uh, the oldest idle connection in the pool. Um, and uh, in scenarios with the keep a life timeout, you may want to switch to LIFO uh, leasing strategy, which means that when a reactor native tries to acquire a connection, it will uh, acquire the most recently used connection. So with this uh, configuration, we again try to fight against this uh, keep a lifetime out. What other uh, use cases we may have that uh, may cause again the connection to be closed? Uh, I um, chose here one such uh, use case with upload limit on the target server. And here uh, in Spring Framework, we have a really nice, uh, a conf a nice configuration to configure max in-memory site for the codecs. And here in my configuration, I configured the max in-memory size uh, to be 512 bytes. Uh, what is my uh, endpoint? Uh, just echoing the body. What we have um, on the client, or this is the endpoint that we will request. Um, that's nothing interesting. The only interesting thing is that we will try to send a content more than what we configured on the server. 
we requested uh, endpoint and now again premature cause exception let's check uh, what we have on the on the server and on the server we have the what we expected actually to see that we exceeded the limit of the max in memory bytes for the buffer in this case uh, we again will close the connection and the client will observe premature close connection uh, so with that, I think that uh, let's stop with our premature close exception friend and um, um, let me say a few words for the connection pool. Um, I already mentioned why uh, we use connection pool. I already mentioned uh, several configurations that you can apply on the, on the connection pool. But uh, here I want to show you when, uh, how um, some sometimes uh, common sense things uh, can cause also connection calls and we tend to forget about them. Here in my scenario, and this is, I promise, this is the last, um, the last demo for the presentation. Um, here, the connection provider is configured with one uh, uh, max connection. So this means when the connection provider creates a connection pool per remote address, this connection pool will have only one connection. Uh, this is my endpoint. Uh, it's nothing, uh, uh, nothing interesting. Uh, I will try to obtain information from two remote services, and then uh, I have here the following uh, the following behavior. When I receive the first response, I will cancel the second one. And actually that was next, next operator does. Um, you receive the first emitted uh, element and the rest is canceled. So let's, let's look at the logs. Here uh, I am creating the connection pool for the example.com. This connection pool is with one uh, connection. Then I create a connection pool for httpbin.org, again with one connection. I establish uh, the connection um, connections to these uh, remote services. And in my use case, because I received uh, the response from the HTTP bin uh, before the response from the example, Actually, that response was the one that was sent as a final response to the end user. Uh, and um, this, uh, this situation for reactor net is uh, it's pretty well, what, how to say it? Uh, reactor net knows what the state for the connection. Uh, we requested httpbino.org, we received the response, we consumed the data, and then we are able to release that channel, to that connection to the connection pool. And actually that, that is what we have here in the log. Zero active connections and one inactive connection. What happens uh, with uh, uh, the connection to the example.com? So if you remember, I said, when you receive the first response, cancel the second one but this cancel operation may happen at any time it may happen while we are sending the request to, to this remote endpoint or while we are receiving a response from this endpoint we do not know at the exact the exact time when when this will be cancelled and from reactor native point of view um, we do not know the state of the connection. Uh, we do not know why the application decided to cancel that request, whether it was uh, be because of an, because some exception was observed or something else. 
So such, access, uh, such connection will not be returned to the connection pool, but uh, will be closed again. Uh, we have a closed connection. And you can see here in the logs, uh, actually the connection pool for examples, uh, example.com is uh, with empty, empty connection pool, no, no active or inactive connections. With that, I think that was all that I've prepared for today. And now I would like to say some um, final words. words. Uh, yes, the use cases that I used today were really, really simple. And I absolutely agree if you say, okay, but the, the real world is different. And because the real world is different, uh, it is important to know your infrastructure. It is important to know how this infrastructure is configured or how you can configure this infrastructure. Having this knowledge, you will be able to configure your solution for this infrastructure. Uh, what, I, what else I would like to, to, to say here? Testing, testing, testing. Uh, testing your solution not only with positive scenarios, but with scenarios with different latencies, different timeouts, even connection drop. Uh, how you can test memory leaks uh, you, while you are developing your solution or you are testing your solution, increase the leak detection level at least to advance. Run your test, observe whether you have memory leaks or not, etc., etc. Uh, again, because the real world is different, you may have um, many proxies or load balancers between your client and your backend service. In these cases, what I can say, TCP dump, end-to-end -end tracing are your friends that you should ask for help. And with that, I would like to thank you for attending this session today. I would like to uh, wish you um, nice uh, experience at the spring one. Uh, these are, uh, here you can see the, the information for Reactor Neti, Spring Framework. Uh, we have uh, Gitter channel, you can contact us there. Uh, for these sessions, uh, there will be Zoom after this, um, right after this one. Uh, there is a dedicated uh, Slack channel where you can ask me anything, uh, Reactor Neti. There is Reactive channel. Again, you can ask me anything, Reactor Neti. So with that, thank you and have a nice day. Well, thank you, Violetta, for that uh, uh, talk. Um, I had to agree with you. I was like, yeah, the, the TCB stacked up is my one of my friends that I look at going, I say stacked up, but uh, Trace is extremely helpful. Well, folks, uh, we're going to have a, uh, if you have questions, feel free to jump on the Slack room. But also, we're going to have a Zoom link. I think it's in the chat that tells you, uh, where you can click in and be able to ask uh, Violetta uh, questions. I uh, appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you all in about 105 for the next talk.